Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Grid Twenty Twenty Four. Rob Barnes joined, as always, by Professor Larry Kelly, a man of many hats. He's going to be on the bench for the Newcastle uh, boys basketball varsity team as a, a volunteer assistant, I believe. Or correct, volunteer assistant. Volunteer. I'm volunteering. Game coach. There you go. <laughs> Take an easy way out. All right. Former Shenango varsity baseball coach, current uh, Penn State Shenango assistant baseball coach. As you can tell, he's uh, they had a practice tonight, and uh, he used to coach the ninth grade uh, basketball team at Newcastle, and he's a current member of the Luxembourg Garbett Kelly and George Law Firm. I, f I feel like I, I need a, a beverage or something after I list all that stuff or, or a five-minute break. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that would probably do it. That that would probably do it because <laughs> some might say I am a jack of all trades and a master of none. Yeah, yeah, and don't forget a private school coach in his younger days. I did the Holy Redeemer Blazers, section champs and diocesan runner-ups. Yes, mm -hmm. my favorite coaching position of all time. When Larry Kelly was a heel in Lawrence County. All right, everybody, we have quite a quite a series of segments tonight. We're going to tell you about a young man that had a, a had a great performance carrying the rock on Friday night, and we'll have our talking points set. We'll turn Larry loose in uh, one portion of that, and then we'll tell you about our schedule, which is kind of an even split this week uh, over the course of two days. But first, athlete of the week, it's Mo Eyes. Senior, five foot nine, hundred eighty pound running back linebacker, again from Mohawk. Sam List. Sam had fourteen carries for one hundred and fifty eight yards and two touchdowns on long runs of forty four and fifty three yards. He also caught a pass for ten yards in a forty one fourteen Midwestern Conference win over Union. Larry, again, we got another home run hitter here, uh, forty four and fifty three yards, taking it to the house as they as they say. Yeah, yeah, and and Mohawk took care of Union as I anticipated that they might do. Uh, Sam is a uh, he's a real power keg, uh, you know, with that size, uh, he can run. He's obviously got good speed because he took it to the house twice from over forty yards, but uh, I think he gets the tough yards for them too you know, which is important. And uh, Mohawk put up 40 points on uh, Friday night. And uh, Mr. List had much to do with that. Yeah. Yeah, Mohawk now is 2-1 and one in MAC action and 3-2 and two overall is uh, what we have. I'm going to double-check my work. Yep, 2-1, and 3-2. and two. So, yeah, they're playing uh, very good football right now, Larry, and at a crucial time. Well, I mean, they, they had a really good game against Union. And, uh, you know, it's an old tri county rivalry. And, uh, you know, Mohawk's going to score. Uh, they just – they have that firepower uh, at several positions. And, uh, you know, they're running the ball really well the last couple games also. So, as I said last week, uh, I, I see them potentially running the table and, and then being a force come the Whippeal playoffs. Uh that's a good football team through the air and on the ground. And Mr. List is a prime example of what it looks like uh, in high school football when you can grind out the big yards, the tough yards, and then take it to the house from uh, over 40 yards. That's, that's an impressive performance, certainly one that is uh, worthy of Athlete of the Week. Another yeah. good choice you made, Pawnee, was you don't make a lot of them, but you're, you're on a streak about three weeks in a row. How about that? <laughs> All right. And yes, as I was reading the Athlete of the Week story that Cody Patterson wrote, uh, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, Mohawk had an injury. And I think uh, that that's leaving Sam List as like their quote unquote bell cow back. He's uh, getting pretty much all the carries. Now, since they won in such a you know dominating fashion, he probably got a little bit of a rest toward the end of the game. So certainly staying healthy for that team is going to be big going forward uh, unless uh, wh whomever, you know, is, is recovering is, is coming back into the lineup. Well, it's a, it's a long season and mm -hmm. uh, you know, those hits uh, they, they take their toll. They wear you down and it's important to keep your running backs fresh. 
you know, I don't care what level. If you're talking high school, college, or the pros, uh, you got to keep them fresh. But uh, I don't know how much they were calling off the dogs because his last touchdown was 53 yards in the fourth quarter. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was still lugging the ball, you know, uh, as much at the end of the game as he was at the beginning of the game. And he had a big game for, uh, for Mohawk. And they're going to continue to need those big games moving forward. You got to have balance. You just, you know, I'm a big believer that to win high school football games, you got to be able to run the ball. And, uh, you know, Mohawk has been able to run the ball, and that's why they're successful. All right. Absolutely. Sam List of Mohawk High School, 158 yards on 14 carries and two touchdowns. He is our most recent athlete of the week for the Warriors, who are two and one in the MAC and three and two overall. Don't stray too far because we have our talking points coming up, and we're going to have two little segments here to, to talk about. We'll do that next, right here on Gridiron. There's one thing I learned growing up around here. People should look out for each other. Be friends and neighbors that you can count on. So it bothers me when people who are hurt in automobile accidents get bullied by the insurance company. I don't let bullies run over my clients. I do what I was taught growing up. Step up, stand up, and speak up for those who can't. I'm Larry Kelly, and I'm a Newcastle guy. Back with you here this week on Gridiron. This is our middle segment, Talking Points. And this week, we're going to start by turning Larry loose with a Red Hurricane Minute or the Red Hurricane 90 Minutes. Whatever Larry Kelly prefers, if you need a bathroom break, you're, you're, you're good. Larry, yeah. No, nah, this one won't be too long, but, you know, they ran into Aliquippa, which is maybe the best team at any level in the WPIAL. Uh, they lost 62-21. Uh, a couple of bright spots and, and not so bright spots. And, you know, first and foremost, I see that Aliquippa ran the ball for almost 300 yards, which told me and tells me that they controlled the line of scrimmage. You know, football games is about controlling the line of scrimmage. Ronnie, if you got the right guys block and you and I can run the ball. And, uh, you know, when you can run it for 300 yards, you're controlling the line of scrimmage. So, you know, that that didn't help Newcastle. Uh, that certainly didn't. And not only did they get beat up on the ground, they got beat up in the air and gave up 228 yards through the air. Uh, you know, so they gave up a total of almost 500 yards, which isn't good. But on the bright side, they put up 21 points against a really good Aliquippa team. Uh, two plays, long touchdown passes, Kyrell, uh, Harris, to Nate McKnight, one for 56 and one for 74 yards. You know, this has been uh, their MO all year, big strike capabilities. And uh, that's what they did against Aliquippa. But you know, the Quips held them to 153 yards rushing, and that might be uh, the lowest rushing total all year for the Red Hurricane. Then let's add to that they had three fumbles and lost all three, which certainly doesn't help. But, look, uh, it's hard to go to Aliquippa and win. Uh, Newcastle certainly showed up. They did not embarrass themselves. It was a competitive game. You know, Aliquippa scored the first possession, and Newcastle came right back and matched them up. But uh, Aliquippa was just too tough. They controlled the line of scrimmage. They ran the ball for almost 300 yards. And, you know, that's a winning formula in high school football. Newcastle has um, on tour this week. And that'll be a big test because that team is good also. So I think we'll learn a lot more about the Red Hurricane this week and their ability to bounce back when they play Montour. Yeah, the schedule maker certainly uh, didn't do any favors to Newcastle. At Aliquippa, at Montour, at West Allegheny, your first three Parkway Conference matchups all on the road. Those are tough games. Those are tough teams. But hey, you know, if uh, you got to prove yourself against the best. And uh, I know that's what Coach Mazzocco is telling his team. That's what he wants to do. And, uh, you know, you learn. Yeah, I used to tell my teams, that I coach at Shenango, it's not that you win or lose. You win or you learn. If you don't learn, then only do you lose. 
And I'm sure that when they watched the film, there was a lot to be learned. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, if they can take what they've learned from their defeated Aliquippa and get better, uh, I think this game, even more than the Aliquippa game, is going to tell us a lot about how Newcastle will finish their season. Yeah. Okay, transitioning over to the Laurel football team. Laurel has won two in a row after starting 0-4. and four. Last week, Laurel had a grinded out 7 nothing win over Northgate. And Larry, uh, you know, you lose four, four in a row in non-conference, and, and, and now the weight, of, the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You've you, you got to turn it around because these games, much like the others, even though they're non-conference, these count. You know, you got to win these, and they've done a good job of that so far, 2-0. and oh, And then Saturday, they go on the road against Summit Academy. And on paper, yeah, they, they should win. But it's tough for teams that play Friday night at 7 to get up at, early in the morning Saturday for a 12 30 afternoon uh, game against a team that you don't know who's on the team from not so much week to week, but day to day. Yeah. You know, looking again at the statistical analysis of the Laurel Northgate game, uh, Northgate had more first downs. They rushed the ball for 175 yards while Laurel only rushed it for 43. Laurel did pick up 131 yards through the air. You know, they got odd game 258 to 174. Uh, that isn't a winning formula, and uh, Coach Cooper would tell you that. That's mm -hmm. not a winning formula. They turned it over one time. Northgate did not. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's a win. And, again, th this team could be undefeated. <laughs> I mean, they've played a lot of one-score games, and this one fell in their, uh, in their favor. But, you know, when you look at it statistically, I'm sure it's not – what the coaches were hoping for. You never you never want to get outrushed in a high school football game. And they got outrushed 175-43, which is unlike Laurel. And again, going back to Newcastle, you know, Newcastle gave up 522 yards to Aliquippa and got outrushed 295 to 153. So normally if you outrush a team two to one, as Aliquippa did to Newcastle, and Northgate outrushed Laurel three to one almost four to one. Actually, it was four to one. You're not going to win many football games doing that. Yeah, I got to imagine with wins and losses in any sport, it's almost like the same analogy of uh, a golfer just needs to see the ball go in the cup to make a, to make a putt or a, a basketball player just needs to see the ball go through the hoop to, to, to make a basket. Same thing with, you know, in football with wins, they lost the first four games and they were really close in three of those four you beat rochester and here you are in a seven nothing game with three seconds left in the game and northgate on about the eight yard line and tony guywitz knocked the ball away on a pass play to preserve the win again you just needed to, to see a win you got that win on friday against the rochester the week before and that probably did a lot of good for them because now they knew how to win well you know i've always say that uh the championship teams uh, they don't go into games hoping to win. They go into games expecting to win. And when you can develop that mindset as a team, um, good things are going to happen. You know, yeah. very few teams that I ever played on in my life did I not go into a game expecting to win, not hoping, but expecting. And, uh, you know, and that's a mindset. If you believe you can, you will. And if you believe you can't, you won't. And, mm -hmm. uh, again, Laurel pulled it out, and I give him credit for that. But when you look at the statistical analysis, if you didn't know the score, you would say that Northgate was the victorious team in that game. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, in inside the numbers, in, in terms of a box score, this will be our last point uh, for, for the talking points. Larry, uh, Team A had uh, ran 47 plays from scrimmage. They executed 47 plays from scrimmage. Team B executed all of 22 plays from scrimmage. Team A had 228 yards of total offense. Team B had 211 yards of total offense. Team A had 186 rushing yards. Team B had 183. Again, total plays run, 47 for Team A, 22 for Team B. Who wins this game? Oh, you wouldn't more times than not say Team A. 
you would. I mean, they they it looks like they controlled the clock. They had more possessions. Uh, they had a few more yards, not a lot of yards. But if big if Team B did win, it was because they converted some big plays. Team B would be Farrell, and they won thirty eight nothing. Yeah. And but let me tell you something. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. I've looked at the, the statistical analysis of this game. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the statistics, it doesn't look like a 38 nothing game. I mean, Wilmington rushed for 183 yards. Farrell, I'm sorry, 186. Farrell, 183. Wilmington passed for 42 yards. Farrell, 28. Wilmington had 228 yards. Farrell, 211. So, I mean, it, it, the penalties were even. This game, when you look at it from a statistical analysis, you would say this is a close game. But obviously, Farrell scored on some big plays uh, in 138 nothing. But when you look at it statistically, it was not a blowout. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other good part for Wilmington is they are 1A and Farrell is 2A. So this is the last time. Wilmington will get a look at Farrell for the 2024 season. Larry yeah. Kelly, our, our schedule segment coming up next. And uh, we have two days worth of, of uh, games to tell you about. And we'll do that next right here on Gridiron. I became an attorney because I believe in hard work, fairness, and human decency. In a word, justice. Our workers' compensation clients deserve justice because in an instant, their hard work turns into hard times when they get hurt on the job. No doubt, life is tough, but so am I. I've been fighting all my life, and I'll keep fighting for you. I'm Joe George, and here in Lawrence County, it's personal. Hey, we're back with you here, everybody, on Gridiron. This is our scheduled portion, as I mentioned in, pre in a previous segment. We have two days' worth of uh, games to talk about. We have Friday, October 4th, four games. Saturday, October 5th, four games. First off, right out of the gate, Newcastle 0-1 and one in Parkway at, and 4-1 and one overall at Montour, which is 1-0 and oh in conference, 5-0 and oh overall. This is, uh, this is a game that Newcastle needs to get back to 500 in terms of conference play. Digging a, an early hole in conference play will not be good in this conference. This is a statement game for the Red Hurricane. This is a statement game. You know, uh, this is one that if they're going to make a statement in the 2024 season, they need to win. Yeah. This is a game where I've heard coaches say this in the past. You can't let insert team name here beat you this week. Meaning, so insert team here would be Aliquippa. So you can't let Aliquippa beat you two weeks in a row, meaning you got to put the Aliquippa game in, in the rearview mirror and focus on Montour. That's true, but you got to learn. I'm sure there were mistakes made, breakdowns in coverage. Like I said, Aliquippa threw the ball for 228 yards and mm -hmm. ran it for 294, a total of 522. There had to be some breakdowns defensively along the way. You know, you watch the film, you fix them, uh, you know, you're mentally prepared to play Montour, and uh, the key to life, don't make the same mistakes twice. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping with the Friday theme, we have New Brighton, one and two, three and three overall at Mohawk, which is two and one, three and two. This is a Midwestern Athletic Conference contest. And very big for Mohawk to get another win and, and put a little distance between uh, a team chasing them. I think they will. Uh, they got New Brighton at home. New Brighton got beat up pretty good by Elwood City last week, 33 nothing. Mohawks better. Uh, they're playing at home. Uh, again, Mohawks a good football team. I expect them to win on Friday. Yeah. Rochester, with these next two games are basically a loser leaves town match if you're, uh, if you're into pro wrestling, Larry. Rochester one and two in Big Seven, one and four overall at Shenango, one and two conference, one and three overall. And again, loser is essentially eliminated from playoff contention. Maybe not officially, but it's going to be awfully hard. Yeah, it's a big game. It's a big game. You know, this is a down year for Rochester. The Wildcats mm -hmm. got them at home. Uh, it's a game they they need to win. And uh, Gene Matsuk's the coach at Rochester. You know how old I am. 
when I wrote for the Newcastle News, I covered Gene Matzuk when he was in high school. So he's coming back to his alma mater. I'm hoping that Chenego can pull this one out. Sammy Patton and the boys, they need this one, and they're playing at home. And, you know, uh, I like I like Chenango's chances this week. I think that, I think Chenango uh, pulled off the win last year over Rochester in a tightly contested ball game. So looking for, you know, a repeat of that accomplishment from last year. And another game that uh, is, is huge, despite the records of both teams, Beaver Falls 0-3, and 0-6 and six overall at Union, which is 0-3, and 0-5 and five overall. This is a Midwestern Athletic Conference matchup. Again, loser pretty much can just play out the story. Yeah. Beaver Falls is struggling. Uh, you know, Union has them at home. This is a game the Scotties have to win. Uh, they have to win. If they don't win this one, they're going to be in trouble the rest of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, th those were Friday games, all 7 p.m. kickoffs. These next four games are Saturday kickoffs with varying t uh, start times. First off, Laurel 2-0 and in the Big 7, 2-4 and overall at Summit Academy, 0-2, and 1-4. and This game kicks off at 12.30 p.m. And again, I spoke to Brian Cooper after the game last week, and he, he says, you know, you'd like to stay on the same schedule uh, playing Fridays at 7 p.m., but, you know, you're just going to have to change protocol, get up early, get on the bus, and go down there and take take care of business. Yeah, and, and I'm sure Laurel will do that. You know, Summit Academy, uh, they they struggle uh, in, their, in, in, in their football program, and they struggled in their baseball program because, as you said, you know, it's a transient – student population it's hard for coaches to get any kind of consistency so i expect laurel to take care of business on saturday yeah, with city lincoln three and zero five and zero overall at western beaver also three and zero over in the midwestern athletic conference action four and one overall again this is a mac battle larry uh First place is on the line. Winner winner gets uh, sole possession of first place. This might be the toughest game that uh, Elwood City has left. And mm -hmm. Western Beavers for real. And they got a really good quarterback. But this Elwood City team is different. Uh, they laid it on New Brighton last week. You know, they ran the ball for 259 yards. Uh, they had a total of 329 yards overall. And uh, Elijah Palmer McCain is a beast. This cat's the real deal. But this is going to be a tough one. This, this, is, a this is a pick em game at Western Beaver. Those, those kids from Western Beaver are tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw Western Beaver play at Union a couple of weeks ago. Good passing game, good special teams unit. You know, Elwood, C El Elwood City's got a lot of talent on that team. Great quarterback and Christopher Smiley. You touched on Elijah Palmer McCain. Uh, good, very suffocating defense. This is going to be a, a, a close ball game. Uh, early afternoon game, 1 p.m. kickoff at Western Beaver. Yeah, this would be a good one. This is the game of the week. It's probably uh, maybe the most uh, evenly matched game of the week. Mm -hmm. Nishanik, 5-1. and one. This is non-conference at Burgettstown, which is 1-4. and four. This is a 2 p.m. non-conference matchup. Burgettstown is a Class 1A school. This year, Burgettstown has been outscored 158-36, to 36, so I uh, believe they're the Blue Devils. They have their hands full this week against the Lancers. Yeah, Nishanik, uh, they played a really good game against Shenango last week. That's a rivalry game. Again, the first thing I look at in every box score is the rushing numbers. And Nishanik ran the ball for 338 yards, put up 100, another 119 through the air, a total of 457 yards. You put up close to 500 yards in a high school game, you're the real deal. Nishanik's the real deal. 2 p.m. kickoff on Saturday for that one. And our last matchup on Saturday, this is a nighttime affair. Wilmington 1-1 one one in District 10, Region 1-1A, 2A. 3-2 overall at Reynolds, which is 1-1 one one in Region and 4-2 and overall. So it'll be an interesting uh, matchup. Th this possibly not too much further behind the Elwood-Western Beaver game for uh, quote-unquote game of the week. Yeah, it's pretty evenly matched, and, you know, Wilmington has to bounce back. But, uh, again, uh, I'll say that if if you didn't look at the score and just looked at the box score, you would have thought that that was an evenly matched game against Farrell. Again, they ran the ball for 186 yards against the Farrell Steelers. 
and uh, put up 228 overall. That's a pretty good effort. And uh, if they do the same thing this week against Reynolds, I, I expect they can win. Uh, let's uh, circle back real quick. Elwood City is 5-0 and for the first time in program history since 1986. So it's quite a long time ago. That's and the that Reagan administration. That is the Reagan administration. So I can uh, I can use my metaphor that they haven't been five and zero oh since the Reagan administration. There you go. Okay, we found a, a corresponding record for you to use that for. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Any idea when the last time Elwood City was six and zero? Oh? And I do know the answer to that. Uh, I have no clue. You're going to tell me though. Yes, I am. But I'm going to allow you to guess one time. Well, it's during the Reagan administration. Okay. Uh, am I going to get a year? How about, well, I would say they were 5-0 in 86. I'll say 1986. Hey, you got it. Ding, okay. ding, ding. All right. I was going to say maybe the Nixon administration in like 1972 or 73. Elwood City was pretty tough back then. They used to play... Uh, in the same conference in the MAC with Newcastle, Sharon, Farrell, Aliquippa, Ambridge, Beaver Falls, Butler. That was a meat grinder also, the old yeah. MAC. And Elwood City was very good back in 86 and 87. I believe they won the, the Midwestern Athletic Conference Championship in 86. I think it was 87 that they lost the WPIO Championship, 19 nothing to Eaton LaSalle, but I, I, I would be wrong if I uh, said it was I'm going to throw out a name here, and I don't know if I'm right or I'm wrong, but uh, Coach Rankin may have been the coach back then. He later went to North Allegheny, uh, and uh, Al Parenti might have been the quarterback then. That's my wife's first cousin. I remember going watching Elwood City play uh, back in the mid-'80s after I graduated from law school, and uh, they were good. They were good. Al Perenni yep. and Coach Rankin. Okay. All right, Larry. So that's your that's your history lesson for the day. All right. Well, I, I always uh, I was never a real big history buff, but uh, you know, if it has something to do with sports, I always want to hear it. I only know two things in my life. Uh, you know, my wife uh, Marisa, uh, she watches like Jeopardy, and she knows all the answers. Uh, the only categories that I could ever answer a question correctly would be if the category were sports mm -hmm. or law. Those two mm -hmm. things I'm pretty good. Other than that, I'm in trouble. Yeah, well, you got me beat because because I can answer sports and I, I just I'm not a history person. I, I don't follow it, but if it's sports history, I'm all in. There you go. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, well, we had a rough week, Larry, with losing uh, Pete Rose and, and Dikembe Mutombo. Uh, yeah, for, for, for you know, let, me, let me say something about Pete Rose. I, I, I was a Pete Rose fan growing up. You know, I wanted to play the game of baseball like Pete played it. Hustle, hard nosed. Uh, you know, he was a flawed human being, like all of us have certain flaws. But as a baseball player, he was the gold standard. And, uh, you know, probably. The greatest compliment I ever got as a baseball player was when my high school coach told me, you know what I remember about you, Larry Kelly? You had the dirtiest uniform on the team after every game. And because I wanted to play it like Pete Rose. I wanted to, you know, listen, if I had to dive, I would dive into a base for a ball. If I had to run somebody over, I was running them over. I was going to do whatever it took to win. And that was Pete Rose. And he had some flaws. Uh, as a human being, unfortunately, that kept him out of the Hall of Fame. But he was a great baseball player. Yeah, absolutely. I I grew up and still am a Pirates fan, but uh, my favorite non-Pirates player was certainly Pete Rose, without a doubt. And I will have a uh, column going in Friday's paper. I got had the chance to meet him, uh, gosh, I was in my 30s, I would imagine, out in Las Vegas. I remember walking through, I, I, I believe it was the uh, forum shops at Caesars Palace. They had a they have a sports memorabilia store, and they, have a, they had a sign that says, signing autographs today, Pete Rose. And I remember saying to myself, all right, my mom says, meet me back in the room at a certain time. I made sure to hurry back and 
you know, like a like a like an eight year old school kid getting off a bus. You know, hurry up, we gotta get you know, we gotta get over there. And, you know, I so I got my uh, autograph with him, picture taken. What, what a time! Yeah, he uh, when I was in college in the old days, we used wooden bats, and those wooden bats, you know, they all they were all autographed. So you used the certain models. Some people used a Willie McCovey model or a Willie Mays or Roberto Clemente. Uh, my bat in college was a Pete Rose model. So, okay. yeah, I was a Pete Rose fan through and through. Yeah, he was, he was great. He was one of my favorites. That's for sure. Yes or no. Does he deserve or belong in the baseball, hall, the baseball hall of fame? Absolutely. Yes. I, uh, I totally agree. Uh, absolutely. There are, there are, there are people that have done a lot worse than him and are in that hall of fame, you know? Uh, he bet on baseball, and as I said, you know, it's probably his own fault that he's not in. Had he admitted up to it, apologized for it, uh, he probably would have gotten in the Hall of Fame. But his behavior after, you know, his uh, ouster from baseball was probably worse than the behavior that caused him to be banned from the game. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but. The betting all took place as a manager, right? He he did not uh, do any of that as a, as an active player. Correct. Okay, yeah. so why you have to separate it and say four thousand two hundred and fifty six hits, three batting championships, no betting. You put him in for that, and you if you have to put on the bottom of the plaque was initially banned for life because of his gambling, which took place as the manager. And. and Listen, Pete Rose wanted to win. I don't care what the game was. He wanted to win. And when he said he never bet against the Reds, I believe that. Because right. that cat wanted to win and would do anything to win. Uh, and if you think about the hypocrisy, I'm watching NFL football games. There are betting sites that come on with every commercial. You can bet the coin toss, the color of shoes that the wide receiver is wearing. And in baseball, it's the same. I mean, you, there's, you can bet the entire game. Uh, I mean, I understand why the rule is in place. I do. But Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. And you belong back here next week, everybody, to, on Gridiron to check out what we have to say as we have a lot of big games around the county. And after this, after this coming Saturday's games, We'll be seven weeks deep into the season, which means we have just three more games after that, and playoffs are right around the corner. So these games are big. This is a big week for Lawrence County football teams and all across the state as well. Can't wait. Can't wait, my man. We'll talk to you next week, my man. All right. That's Larry Kelly. I'm Ron Fawniwaz. Best of luck to everybody in the county, coaches, players, student athletes, what have you. Get these wins, get a playoff berth. They're coming coming around the corner as far as uh, postseason. We'll see you back here next week right here on Gridiron. You know, football games is about controlling the line of scrimmage. Ronnie, if you got the right guys blocking, you and I can run the ball. And, uh, you know, when you can run it for 300 yards, you're controlling the line of scrimmage.